It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 274 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 13th of August 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hi. And Lucas Randall. Hey. And we're here because of the generosity of people like Ryan James, Dan Kruger, Josh Kingston Lee, Brett Henry, EJ, Chris Curtin McGee, Sean McElligot, Richard Sutherland and Pete Ellinger all of whom have chipped in to help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging on Patreon, which I highly recommend you do because we need the money. Uh, We've got computer problems. We've got lots of ongoing services to pay for to keep this going. So we appreciate all the help we can get. But before you do that, have a listen to us rambling on about dinosaurs, intergalactic star stuff and bees. But let's flash back to 2014, when a small group of plucky podcasters discussed the discovery of what was possibly the largest dinosaur ever. That podcast was Science on Top, and now in 2017, it's official. The giant sauropod discovered in Argentina in 2013 is the largest dinosaur ever discovered, and it's now officially known as the Patagotitan. Penny, do you want to bring us all up to speed? I do. So this is kind of cool. Like part of me is like a uh, biggest, smallest, oldest, longest, whatever. But it has, it actually is. Well, no, because I mean, why? Why does it matter that it's a big dinosaur? Is it interesting for some other reason? And, and my argument is going to be, yes, it is. The size doesn't matter. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, um, Dinosaur was discovered in 2013 in Argentina, and I think as soon as it was found, it was known it was big. The thigh bone that was found was eight feet from end to end, so taller than a human, which is pretty impressive. And it's been um, analysed, the skeleton, because what's really cool about where this fossil was found, the Patagonian? Is it Patagonian? Patagonian. Patagotitan. That's how I'm saying it. Patagotitan. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to say um, fast, otherwise you're going to lose the cadence. Yeah. yeah. The place where it was found seems to have been not a mass grave, because like, all these dinosaurs didn't lie die at the same time, but a spot where I think it was at least six different skeletons from the same species were found all in the one spot. So they've, we've basically found a whole complete skeleton it's not one of those oh we found a little bit of one vertebrae and now we've reconstructed the whole dinosaur like we have a really good idea about all of the bones is it or almost all of the bones and what is really really cool is that even though based on analysis this is the biggest dinosaur at about 69 tons is that these specimens were probably not fully grown adults they were young and still growing. So Wow. So they would have gotten even bigger uh, as yeah. I got older. That's extraordinary because these are 130 feet from nose to tail. So that's uh, 40 metres or so. That's extraordinary. Yeah. And that's a, that's a young'un. That would have gotten bigger. That was a young'un. And I think it is kind of cool because when you get to this scale, the, the whole physiology of the animal is just – different to anything we sort of really understand so you know that whole thing of like oh ants are just amazingly strong and they can lift 50 times their body weight but a person can't do that so the size of an organism does affect the way that it functions and what it can do so these animals are so unusual we don't have anything really like them in the animal kingdom how many elephants was it like 14 and 14 elephants (laughs) You know how much I love the comparisons. It would have also been, where was it, uh, a seven-storey <laughs> building. It would have been the size of yeah. two trucks with trailers parked end to end. Uh, they're the only comparisons I've seen so far, but I'm sure it was several. I, I want to start seeing comparisons of, of size and mass 
and volume to how many Antarctic uh, icebergs? <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> it, it was dinosaur? smaller than the iceberg. <laughs> it's smaller than the state of Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not impressed then. Uh, <laughs> but no, you're right, Penny. The, the physics just get so much mm, more complicated mm. at this size. I mean, I think we already know a lot of the bones in large animals like this are hollow because... You just can't sustain that much weight otherwise if they were fully solid and things. Uh, it, but it, it's it, interesting. Like, like, why did they get so big? What was going on? It's, um, it's about the same time that all the flowering plants became diverse and the climate became warmer. But, I mean, that's not a complete answer. Like, mm. like, what happened? How did they behave? Maybe they lived in water most of the time. I have no idea. So how did they know... Like I, I saw that they said, you know, the bones show that they were, you know, sort of quite young adults, but they were still quite young and they were still growing, as you said before. How do they know that? Did it? Do you have any idea how they've ascertained that from, from the fossil bones? I don't know that, but I know that for humans, say they, they know that you know certain bones will fuse in maturity or so Oh, right, on. okay. Yeah, so I'm course. guessing that based on other ones like it, they kind of can have a go, but I, I, I don't know exactly, yeah. It was, um, I, I don't know if you guys noticed the, uh, the, the opening sort of line of this, uh, or the opening paragraph of the story in The, the Atlantic, which, which was a bit sad. It was the, mm. so in 2013, an old Argentinian shepherd named, uh, too much for me to handle, found a fossilised bone protruding from the rock on the farm where he worked. The remains of giant dinosaurs festoon Argentini uh, Argentina's landscape. And following strict rules that govern such fossils, the farm's owners, um, the Mayo family, contacted local paleontologists. By the time the team arrived, mm. Hernandez had passed away. How long did they take? I mean, or is this like get, the like, curse of the Patagotitan dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> you discover it, you disturb its bones, and within a few days you die. You don't. <laughs> that's right. That, I sort of read that. I was like, wow, that that escalated so quickly. I, I wasn't sort of like, you know, do they just the train system's really bad there and. You know, <laughs> well, I guess if, if you're going to organise a team of paleontologists to drop what they're doing, go out somewhere in the desert and examine it, that's going to take a, a few weeks. Well, clearly, they didn't drop what they were doing. They slowly <laughs> put away what they were doing after giving it careful consideration. But uh, yeah, I felt bad that this guy never found out um, how you know literally big his discovery was. It's a bit of a shame. Um, anyway. The, I guess at least he got out of uh, a bit of work ploughing that part of the field that he would have had to do what turned out to be the last days of his life. So I don't know. Maybe I've given this too much thought. It just uh, it did jump out of me. Also, he doesn't Poor get Nandis. the credit for the discovery. The, like the name is Patagotitan Maorum. The first half is because it was found in the Patagonian region. The Maorum part is the Mayo family who owns the farm. Um, yeah, it's he, he gets nothing, but, you know. Them's the breaks, I, I guess. Uh, yeah. And when I read that an old Argentinian shepherd named Aureliano Hernandez, I apologize. You're right. My, it is too much brain, for you. <laughs> my, my brain converted that to like an Argentinian shepherd being like a German shepherd. And I thought, that dog's got a... Wow. No, that's, <laughs> that wasn't what it meant. No, it's literally a shepherd. So I apologize to all Argentinian shepherds. Um, uh, and, and all shepherds who are German, because you've just accused them all of being dogs. But, you know... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the thing that gets me with something an animal this big, especially since we know it's a herbivore, we can look at its teeth and we know that it was eating all these plants. Like that's a huge amount of energy to keep something this big mm -hmm. going. It, it obviously it would have been a very slow moving creature, but it it's the amount of calories you'd need just to keep it alive seems extraordinary oh. to me. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Cretaceous, so it, it had a lot of uh, access to lots of vegetation, obviously. It probably didn't move all that much. It probably just stood there chewing its immediate neighbourhood until it had to move, you know, several body lengths, and then it's got months' worth of food, you know, just around it. I don't know. I'm, we, I'm... We, no, we did actually talk about a story uh, like that many years ago, uh, which was a theory that these big sauropods, you know, the long skinny necks, the big body and the long skinny tails, 
probably didn't use their long necks for getting up to the top of trees like a giraffe does, but more just so they could stand in the one spot and sweep their head around a long area, like a vacuum cleaner sort of just hoovering up in a wide radius around it. Which yeah, makes because, sense. you know, at, at the height of this thing, it really didn't need a long neck to get to the top. <laughs> it's kind of already there. It's true. I also like what you said, Penny, about maybe it was in water a lot of the time, which would support its body weight and everything. I don't know if there's any I have no idea if there's that. any evidence a, of, yeah. It's a good theory. But The uh, artist's illustration of it looks a bit absurd. Like the, the length of the neck and the tail just looks out of proportion to the body. And I know we're talking about sauropods, so it's not like they, you know, like anything we have now, but it really looks like a snake with some legs drawn on. Like it just, you know, it just looks so long. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair description. But, you know, I... Can you imagine the weight that would have been on its neck muscles and its, and its vertebrae? And that's just crazy. And that's another reason in support of the grazing idea, because... To get blood flow up that, I mean, we know the extraordinary systems that giraffes have to get that up, but this is much longer than a giraffe's neck as well. So the musculature and the blood flow, the cardiovascular systems would have had to be very extensive for that sort of thing. But very cool. Uh, it also sort of ties in with another chance dinosaur find at the, a, um, a mining site just outside of Alberta in Canada. Uh, which was a discovery made in 2011. Uh, they just, just you know, noticed a small bit of uh, fossil or whatever and contacted authorities. And this has turned out to be one of the most well-preserved dinosaurs ever. It literally looks like a statue. Uh, Penny, do you want to tell us a bit about this one? Yeah, this is a dinosaur, um, Borealopelta, Borea discovered. And it does, it literally looks like a carving of a dinosaur. In fact, it's so well-preserved that... Um, with our current technology, it's not possible to actually examine its bones because all of the outside of the dinosaur is just, you know, it's too hard. We just can't get into it. So it's. Oh, what do you quite mean by amazing. that? You mean like we can see the skin or something and we can't. We can see the skin. You can see the skin. It literally looks like someone has reconstructed a dinosaur, this fossil. And what's so sad is, I mean, of course, it's wonderful that it was found and I'm sure that. Other things have not been found, but that half of it got destroyed by the excavation equipment before it was noticed. But this is quite an astonishing find. It's it's a great way to think, well, how accurate are our reconstructions? I mean, we don't know if dinosaurs had like fleshy antennae or whatever that there's no evidence for. Or um, I mean, look at the feathers debate. Yeah. That's sort of yeah. – that's taking a long time to get going. So this one – has still has pigments in the skin and it's just it's fascinating so this was not a uh, seagoing creature but it somehow ended out washed out to sea so it was preserved because it it drowned it floated badly up and sank down onto the ocean floor and very very quickly got sealed off by sediment and preserved in a really great state it must so, have been really quickly for that. It must have been, and also so quickly, a, a, like so. an, an airtight seal, really, mm, essentially, mm. for no bacteria to decay it. That's that's pretty cool. So it's an ankylosaur. Basically, they're thick, heavy set. Uh, they're they're big animals, but they're not. They're they're working on all fours. They're not like your typical Tyrannosaurus type thing. It would have weighed yeah. about one and a half tons, and it it, it was armor plated wasn't it? It's got mm. big, long spikes jutting out from its shoulders and its neck. Uh, it looks kind of like an armadillo sort of transformer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. No, just yeah, leave it at I that. Do, an armadillo transformer. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we can definitely say this was probably not feathered. And I realise I just said definitely and probably in the same sentence. But oh. to, it, it's very unlikely that this was feathered dinosaur. It was an armor-plated tank, basically. But, yeah. So, when it was – once it was excavated, it took what the technician called Mark Mitchell, who, you know, chipped it out of the rock, 7,000 hours over 5.5 years. Wow. 
I Think can about it, that, everyone. I, I'm imagining a very annoyed mining company who's not getting any money from that section of the oh, mine. Oh no, no. It, it, it had already been removed oh, and um, out of the yeah, yeah. But it's just to just because often when a fossil is found, like it doesn't just easily snap out of the rock. You have to carefully, carefully pick away at it with, I imagine, toothbrushes and you know. Yeah. Well, to things, get it, it, does, it sounds like things didn't go too well getting this thing out. Because they yeah. apparently <laughs> – were you going to talk about that? The, the, they broke uh, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. I know. But it's quite amazing. And what I also thought was quite interesting about this is what do the pigments found in it mean? Because it's been interpreted as having um, a countershading camouflage pattern, which is dark on the top and light underneath, which is quite a common – pattern in nature and it means that it helps cancel out the effect of having a shadow it makes an animal look a bit flat and inconspicuous and that's really interesting if it did have that pattern because it's hard to imagine this sort of really heavily armored thing being a prey animal and yet maybe it was however it's not certain that this the pigments were from its actual lifespan they could have been deposited later in the sea so some of these molecules might have been there. So so we don't necessarily know for sure that it had that camouflage pattern and it was a prey and, and then that leap from that that it could have been a prey animal. You know, we don't know a lot, I guess, about how dinosaur skin pigmentation changes as it drowns and I think they call it a bloat and float, which... Charming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> charming. But it's just, it's just amazing to look at the picture of it and think, well, this is an actual dinosaur fossil. I've never seen anything quite like it, and I thought it was um, pretty special. It does look a lot like the dragons in Game of Thrones. I have to put it that does. out there. <laughs> it does. That in that in itself is quite impressive that we found a dragon. <laughs> but let's move on, and Lucas, have a listen to this. Because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. We are made of star stuff. That was, of course, Carl Sagan. And it turns out that half of the star stuff that we're made of comes from stars outside our galaxy. It's intergalactic star stuff. Yeah, this... this really surprised me actually for quite a long time there's been um uh, it's been understood that that um, material is able to travel between galactic neighbors so uh, of course we know that andromeda is the the closest you know large spiral galaxy to us but there's a whole lot of dwarf galaxies that are considered satellites to to our you know to the milky way that are that are much much closer so you know we're we're talking about um uh, you know, galaxies that are that are significantly closer. In fact, I think we did a story on the Large Magellanic Cloud sharing material with the Milky Way mm. not too long yep. ago. I can't yep. remember. There's exactly a little how. bridge between the two of little atoms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, there, there's a lot of dwarfs that are that are really, really close um, uh, to the Milky Way compared with, um, you know, with Andromeda, which is um, uh, it's about sort of two and a half you know, million light years away. Um, so we've known, you know, for quite a while. In fact, going back, there was a story back in 95 uh, about a discovery of these these galactic winds that were blowing material into interstellar or intergalactic space because they found heavier elements that shouldn't really be there because after the Big Bang, we expect to find, he- you know, mainly hydrogen and helium and, and not really much of the heavier elements. But but this this team back then found that there were actually, you know, there were traces of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and nickel and a few other things in intergalactic space. So how the hell did that get there? Well, it's basically getting there from a combination of um, explosions of supernovae that, that throw out material at, at uh, you know, massive velocities and also from the jets that come out of the uh, supermassive black holes at the, the centre of, of, of most galaxies. So, you know, we, we see some of these jets, particularly when the, the uh, galaxies have been through a feeding frenzy, um, they, th- they throw off, you know, these jets. And the, and the jets that... that um, that are thrown off are thrown off at such velocities that they can pick up other material. And that's often the sort of garden variety matter that you would find that makes up, 
second, third, fourth uh, generation stars. So, you know, we've we've known for quite a while that there's stuff in the in the inter, intergalactic medium or intergalactic space. So that's not a, a huge surprise. What really surprised me about this, and I'm assuming the the study authors as well, is that um, the a, a series of simulations that they've done based on what what we currently know indicates that the amount of stuff within the Milky Way that's come from elsewhere is perhaps as much as half. <laughs> that's really surprising. That's that's very. Uh, I, was, I was stunned to to read that it could be uh, as mu- as much as half. We, I guess, when you factor in, so go on. I was going to say, how do we know? But then you've already said it was basically on computer models, and we haven't actually. It was, yeah. So it was simulations we can't that led to this. Uh, exactly. So sim- simulations that led to this, and I, th- I think it's it's worthwhile momentarily dipping back into the something that we've discussed many many times because people might not have heard those episodes, but. It's it's easy to dismiss simulations unless you understand that models are used in right across different fields of science, and and they're they're really only adopted as a model for for prediction when they can predict what we already know. So you put in um, data, uh, you know, from earlier, and you run the simulations and see whether what you end up with matches what we can observe right now. And if you can do that reliably, then your models are, are, are fairly uh, consistent with reality. So you don't, you know, you can't just say, well, it's simulation, what does it mean? Uh, you know, can we rely on it? Because, yeah, these simulations, if you run them for other things that we can measure outcomes on and they match, then you know that the simulation is doing its job. So that's effectively what's happened here. They've fed data into it from, uh, from you know, other measurements and, and matched it with observational uh, results and gone, okay, matches. And then they run these simulations based, based on a broader data set going back even further. And they can see that, wow, this actually looks like we've got these galactic winds that are, that are, that are traveling in between galaxies and dwarf galaxy neighbors and so forth and, and exchanging material. And, and it kind of also makes you think that the, the panspermia stuff that, um, you know, theories about the sharing of potential matter and materials and organic materials between planets is is really no big deal when you can think that this you know you can exchange matter between freaking galaxies <laughs> um you know you 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 change that to to planets that are much much closer and we know for example that we found you know pieces of mars on earth or whatever so we know for sure that there's matter exchange between them probably from periods of bombardment and so forth uh, because they get thrown out of atmospheres and then they end up in similar orbits and of course Planets come along and plough through them. But anyway, got a little bit off track. So yeah, that's that's really the the uh, the interesting thing about this: the fact that uh, these um, these simulations predict that that up to half of the matter that uh, that's in our solar system, for example, has come from elsewhere, other galaxies, and that's <laughs> that's freaking awesome. <laughs> I mean, there's no way I would have thought that was the case. No, not half. I can see you know maybe ten percent or something, but half is pretty yeah. extraordinary. Um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, these are models that they've run several times and all of that. It wasn't just a, well, we did one freaky <laughs> observation. Yes. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot more. If you're interested, you can follow the show notes and you'll find there are links from the articles to um, more information about the actual study itself and the, and the types of simulations. But, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's why I sort of wanted to delve into that just briefly because they're, it's, as I say, it's easy to dismiss simulations as being, well, okay, it's just a model. Yeah. You know, climate <laughs> change, just a model. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of modelling and maths, when it comes to bees, we've always heard different stories. We've heard that, A, they can't possibly fly. According to our understanding of physics, it's impossible. How do they do it? We'll never know. We then heard that there was turbulence and eddies in the way that they manipulated the air with their wings. That is, I think, not so solid anymore either. Basically, the problem comes down to they have such small wings, how can they carry such a large body weight? And it turns out it's all because of simple maths. Is that right? I, I'm not sure I'd call it simple maths. Um, <laughs> it must I be if the little the bee can do it. I mean, how hard can it be? Well, I guess this comes under the banner of fluid dynamics and aerodynamics mixed in mm-hmm. together to, to some extent, um, which are, are pretty complex. Not quite the... Fluid, what is it? The magnetodynamics. Oh my god, oh, that's that's really scary stuff. But in in this case, uh, yeah, as you said, Ed, the initially it was felt that their wings 
was simply not big enough. And you probably heard this as a kid. I certainly did that, you know, bumblebees in particular couldn't possibly fly. Their wings are far too small. And yet they do it despite physics. Mm -hmm. That's how, you know, they just believe they're the little bees that, that, that could. Um, obviously that was crap. So they, <laughs> they were clearly flying and they had a way of doing it. And, and part of the problem was the, the understanding of their, of how their wing services work because it was assumed that they worked in a way similar to, you know, aircraft, which is, you know, just a, a, a pressure difference basically, you know, really oversimplifying but you know that that whole thing about the the pressure being lower above the wing and higher below it and that sort of gives it lift and that sort of thing again vastly oversimplified that's not really the case with bees and they they had discovered a while ago about these these vortices that that um uh, that form at the at the end of their wings and on the leading edge of their wings so it was felt that maybe these vortices actually generate lift and that is what has changed now. So this new um, this new study, uh, this mathematical model has has looked at data that's been measured from real wings, and they've found that the these leading edge vortices don't actually generate lift at all. But what they do appear to achieve is they change the the effective angle of attack of the wing surfaces so that they can be at a more aggressive angle without stalling. And that changes the characteristics of the lift so that they, you know, the, the fact that uh, they can be at a more aggressive angle without stalling means they don't just fall out of the sky. And actually, there's a, an amusing paragraph in there. Uh, where was it? Um, I find the whole idea of a bee stalling to be quite amusing. It's, I feel like they don't have an engine that's going to stall. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, that's exactly right. <laughs> but uh, no, there was, there was a, a quote about, um, oh, I can't find it now. Uh, there was a quote about them falling out of the sky and 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 bumping their behinds on the ground, and it just it sounded quite amusing. I think it's in uh, yeah, I can't find it now. It's anyway, not a new science um, article. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. I saw yeah. it, but anyway, can't <laughs> find it now. Anyway, point being, you know that uh, the model is a little bit different. And again, the reason this caught my eye was simply because. Um, it's it's that part of that evolution of understanding, which is awesome. You know, we 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 thought, okay, now we understand how bees' wings work. It must be something to do with these vortices. We love vortices. Vortices are awesome. And there was a period of time when I remember it was new news to have wingtip, you know, winglets on aeroplanes because we found out that wingtip vortices cut down on the drag and give a little bit more lift to the ends of wings, which meant the wings couldn't be, you know, didn't have to be quite as long, and and they it was then more economical to fly. Well, you know, yep, vortices are good, but in this case, they're working in a different way, which is cool. <laughs> it's the second, a third paragraph from the end, actually. It says that if they did stall, they would then fall out of the air and bounce along the floor before finally skidding to a halt with a sore behind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but this is all well and good, but if history has taught us anything, it's that in a few years we'll find another way that bees can fly and something else that they're doing and that this doesn't yeah, yeah. complete the We've picture. We've just discovered and- that bumblebees yeah. have got tiny little jetpacks. We never knew they were there. And when that happens, we'll probably talk about it on the show as well. So Yeah, I'm sure we will. Something to look forward to. But I think that's it for the show today. All the links to the stories are on the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 274. Let us know what you think. Give us a comment. Get in touch with us on social media. And of course, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you like the show and you want to join that fabulous list of people I mentioned at the start, go to scienceontop.com slash donate. Make a donation on Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. This episode was edited with Giant Dinosaur Bones by Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Are you ready? Okay, there's a New Jersey boy. He was thrilled to get a personal response from NASA when he sent them a letter because he was applying for a job there. He's nine years old. His name is Jack Davis. These are his qualifications. Here they are. My sister says I'm I'm an alien. (laughs) I've seen almost all the space and alien movies I can see. And I'm young, so I think I can learn like an alien. He signed a Jack Davis, Guardian of the Galaxy. Well, get this. Two NASA directors weren't quite ready to offer him a job. The $124,000 salary. But they did write back, and they even called Jack at home. They told the fourth grader, 
you know what? You might have a future in space if you study hard and you do well in school. <laughs> I like it. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. If not, maybe science fiction novels. Yeah. Good writer. Right. Clever. Exactly. Cute. Right.